Hi guys, and welcome to Piano and Keyboard Artist, where we discuss the artists related to pianos, keyboards, and synthesizers. And I've got a very special guest today as part of my Violator album review series. I want you to introduce you to Mr. Pino Pischetola. Did I say it right? Yes, right. Yeah, very good. Better than my teachers at school. <laughs> Thank God. Amico, how are you today? Very good. Thank you. Very nice. Where about in Italy are you? Milano. Milano, see. Si. Yes. Um, listen, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to talk to us today on Good Friday. It's uh, a pleasure. Are you, are you, you must be Catholic. I, I, I was Catholic as well. Yeah, it's, uh, yes, today is, uh, we call uh, Venerdì Santo. See. Si. That's right. That's right. And uh, and to my subscribers, if you hear me saying "si" and "grazie," I used to um, run an Italian restaurant back in my a hundred years ago. So uh, I I understand the Italian uh, way of speaking and everything. And I'm I'm always so at home with uh, with you guys. You so like feel so at home with you. But listen, thank you so much for coming on. Let's jump into this. Um, you were involved with one of the most iconic records in the history of electronic music, <laughs> in my opinion, yeah. uh, Depeche Mode Violator. Yes. So let's start off. It was 1989. So how did you get involved with it? Uh, actually, the Depeche Mode were looking for a studio in Italy because uh, the, they wanted to record uh, the album in, in two different places. One was a PUC studio in Denmark, which was more like isolated. And, uh, and then they wanted to record in Italy, in a, possibly in a city, to, to have the opposite of uh, isolation. And uh, I was working in this uh, beautiful studio called uh, Logic Studio in Milano. And uh, that was... Um, uh, on by La Bionda Brothers. They were uh, two producers and artists from the 70s doing Ita Italian disco music. And, uh, and they, they had a lot of hits. And, uh, and so they, they could afford to build this studio that was uh, in the 80s uh, owned by a record company, CGD. But then they, in the early 80s they bought it and uh, renew it with uh, studio designer Andy Munro English very one of the best and uh, and and bought a big SSL desk and uh, everything was there like a really high profile international studio but was in Milano mm -hmm. and um, and there were uh, two or three studios like this big in Italy but uh, Flood, who was the producer, knew that Alan Mulder uh, came there to produce an Italian artist called Gianna Nannini. And, uh, and so uh, I was assisting Alan Mulder in the mixing uh, stages of this album. And, uh, and so Flood asked Alan about the studio and he said it was very, very good. And, uh, and then he asked if uh, he knew somebody that he can recommend to work on the record as an engineer. And uh, he suggested me, which made me really happy about it. And, uh, and so I was involved because of this. And uh, the idea was to do a six week session to record uh, half of Violator and uh, and then finish Personal Jesus, because the mixing of everything else was done later on when they finished after Puck Studios. Uh, but Personal Jesus was uh, finished in Milano. Okay, wow. Fascinating bit of history. Um, and when, if we look at how famous and amazing Violator is, are you proud to be involved in it? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> still, still today, after 30 years, uh, is one of is my one of my biggest credit, if not the biggest credit, if I want to analyze as a 
success of a record and the importance uh, it had in the music in the music history and uh, and I'm I'm really happy because the, the there was be, because the producer was flawed right which also is one of the best engineer ever in the he, 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 he worked on so many great records before violator and um to me because sometimes you work in the studio with producers but they are more like uh, uh, not in technical producer but more of a concept producer yeah so in a way you can uh, if you if you turn the wrong knob they don't even realize it you know what i mean but with flood with these years i was so scared of every move i was doing because i was with one of the best that could could uh, really understand if I if I could make it or not as an engineer. And uh, funnily enough, when, uh, because uh, we were used to go to clubs after the sessions, the studio were finished. One night I asked him after a few days if I was uh, doing well. And he said, yes, yes, don't worry, you are doing well. Otherwise, after 10 minutes, you will uh, not even make coffees because uh, he said this record is too important to me to to mess to mess it because the engineer is not at the level and uh, and he said if uh, this makes you happy this happens in 80 percent of the studios where i go flood was like firing the in-house engineer after 10 minutes all right because it was not good enough so I was uh, I was panicking in a way and nervous, but also I because of this pressure I tried to to do my best. And also I was not I didn't have a big responsibility. You know what I mean? My responsibility was to do to manage the studio. I knew all all the um, wiring and all the every machine how it worked uh, to record to to put microphones. And uh, in a way, I was uh, sure that if I was messing something or may or make it wrongly, uh, they will fix it for me. You know what I mean? The, yes. There was not the, the possibility of something recorded badly because uh, nobody realized it. I mean, the, the level there was a top, top level you can have. I can imagine. I can imagine you being very. You must have been. How old were you? you must have been in your twenties, quite young. Yeah, it was like uh, twenty-five, oh, maybe. Yeah. 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 So you're, uh, as you say, you're. It's that position where you're. You're nervous, but you're just nervous enough that you try a little bit harder. But um, yeah. he obviously saw you were enthusiastic. Um, he was. Did you say flood? He used to fire a lot of mix uh, uh, engineers. No, I mean. This was he said. He says that when he goes in other studios, yeah, if he doesn't find the engineer good enough, yeah, he, he does it himself because he is so good at it. You know what I mean? So ah. he has to do producer and engineer. In this case, he was doing the producer, and also when when uh, some some decisions had to be made. Of, on the sound obviously he was on it absolutely yeah yeah um so um obviously flood um alan wilder has spoken about flood being um you spoke about that earlier pino some producers are more like executive producers yeah you know, they come in they know they, they you know they, they, they concept they understand the concept yes. but um alan wilder spoke about flood being like a 360 degree producer you know, he could program yeah. a sampler he could he could use analog synthesizers modulars so and and, and what he called screwdriver work so he was a really yeah. uh, a fully fledged producer and you learned a lot from him did you absolutely i mean i was watching every move and the, the studio you imagine the, there was a big control room and this uh, huge truck comes from england uh, he he puts down all the flat cases with the instruments and then he goes uh, drives back to england without even eating you know really? what I mean? it was a yeah and uh, and so it, they brought so many instruments and uh, it took me i think a couple of days just to wire everything up and have it ready and the control room was full of synthesizers and uh, and samplers 
and uh, everywhere you turn around there is uh, instruments and also flood uh, brought his own yeah the roland uh, system 700 yes. and uh, some akai samplers some uh, midi moog and uh, and so there was technologically there was a lot i mean yes so you obviously um uh, this was during this was the first single this was post personal jesus is that right no i mean the, we we started recording uh, i think the first song was a uh, policy of truth okay we 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 did the policy of truth word in my eyes hello uh, personal jesus mm. and uh, so we we did like five six songs recorded in that session okay so you were around for most because sorry just just i should know this because i'm such a depeche mode mm. geek so which songs were done in your studio not all of them some of them were done in another studio is that right yeah the, the right. alf alf was done in uh, milano yes and this is a word in my eyes personal jesus yeah uh policy of truth yeah. hello yeah. this i remember dangerous i think was done in that session maybe dangerous was done in another studio while Francois Kevorkian was mixing Personal Jesus. Oh. But, uh, and then, so this half of the record was done there and the other half was done in uh, Puk studio in Denmark. And then everything was mixed, except Personal Jesus that was mixed in Milano. Okay, Pino, that's very interesting. So obviously your job as the, the in-house engineer was to assist Flood in the you know producing this record so you would do everything from managing the studio but you would also be there to as you say plug things in mike so you, yeah, you had to make mike, sure yeah, that everything, everything works yeah. Yeah. yes yes yeah. manage the tapes do the yeah. put microphones uh, use the desk and do the everything yeah was, and, uh, have you obviously it was a long time ago and but um so far your memory seems very very on point so that's great um <laughs> which um are there any sort of memories of any songs that uh, were particularly difficult to get right? Not really. I think I think I remember the um, what was a uh, what took some time was to define an approach. Yes. To to do the record because you know uh, one thing that uh, really got me interested in. in in was the fact that uh, as a as a philosophical choice they never use the sound that they have used before so every sound has to be made from scratch i mean at the time it was like that so the, um, the this this idea that uh, before recording there are the demos that martin gore did and uh, and the old work was how much to keep of the demo vibe, how much to change. Yes. And it, this was a flawed uh, work, like to, uh, to try to understand what to keep, what to change. But the, uh, if I have to think now that I much more experienced in the music making process, because I, fortunately I keep on engineering records, uh there was never like a, a a stuck moment like what we do now it was more like uh, okay we need to do this and it takes time and we do it and uh and so the because you know the studio the work in the studio we were working uh, every day from uh, noon to midnight with a break for at seven for dinner and uh, the the working habit was almost military like uh, there was no time lost in uh, in uh, in um, hanging out you know yeah. what i mean every every uh, all the time was used to make music really concentrated really on it because i mean they knew it was an important record for them mm. and uh, and so there were, yes, these meetings in the control room where everybody was saying his opinion about the direction I was going. But 
was more of a like uh, this takes time and we use the time to do it yes but uh, yeah. the was very creative i mean like for example the, the stomps of personal jesus they were really like recorded uh, in different places of the studio even on uh, there is a there was a staircase outside the, the studio because this was a five floor building and this uh, stair had a long echo if you play the sound on top and mic it at the bottom uh -huh. and so we also recorded the stomps of personal jesus there then on on fly cases in a drum boot in different situation and yeah. then everything was sampled and replayed on the emulator 3 and this was uh, was like a really long process but at the time you couldn't do it in a different way to achieve this mm. Well, the, the, as you say, they didn't do things quickly. Everything had to be every detail. And you listen to yes. that record. And we listen to the stomps. It's a little bit like what Gareth Jones, I think he gave them the idea sort of early on using the acoustic yes. spaces. Of course, I don't, yes. Flood, Flood, Flood and Gareth Jones are both, you know, geniuses in their own way. But I think... Um, if you listen to the the stomping sound on that personal Jesus, and I'm thinking yeah. now of the um, the Francois Kavorkin mix, that the way it starts, doom, 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 you can actually yeah. hear, you can actually like hear and feel the air behind the the sounds. If you know what I mean? Yes, because the 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 main difference with the sampling approach of before, I mean, this was already ahead of how people was working with loops later on. Yeah. Because the um, before, because of the technology and the small sampling time of samplers, maybe they would sample one stomp and play it only yeah. that stomp. Yeah. With this, the old pattern was recorded, mm. and then was sliced, was sliced mm. piece uh, stomp by stomp, yeah. and replayed for precision with the with the sampler. But the pattern sounded the same as when it was recorded sound wise mm. so this was the main difference the approach to record acoustic instruments guitars in a real uh, studio space mm. but treat it like electronic music yes yes pino um you're obviously a very talented engineer and producer so thank you for you, no you 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 are I've, I've i've done the research on you and um what he has an interesting question if we made Violator again today with the technology that we have today, it would probably, probably well, it would be a lot easier because, you know, technology has made things easier. But would it sound the same? Very close, I think, because the, the process was, uh, the, the sound was almost decided before doing it. Mm. That's why it took so long. Maybe they say, oh, here we need a, like a, synthetic hi-hat and then the next two hours will be make a synthetic hi-hat okay. so it was not like experimenting and then picking up the best it was more like deciding before what to do and then do it with the technology at the time for example there was a they they were really concerned about timing of midi for example which if somebody doesn't know, it's a big issue because MIDI is like a serial protocol. So there is a delay when you send the data out of the computer. And uh, with their music, even like uh, milliseconds can make a difference on the feel of the... And so we spend like, uh, they had a synchronizer to, to sync the computer with MIDI to tape. And we spend a lot of time fine tuning by half of a millisecond the offset between the tape and the computer to get it right now of course these require a, a keyboard a button yeah. press okay yeah. and at the yeah. time you had to rewind the tape check it rewind yeah. the tape again yeah. check it again change the value so i think today will be faster process a faster process yeah, yeah. but yeah not uh maybe a too much different sounding record i got you i got you yeah i mean depeche mode were always pushing the frontiers of sound and technology and um and we all know that but you obviously 
met the band because the band were all there. So yeah. can you um, clarify the rumors that um, most, well, obviously this was, who was there in the studio most of the time? It was you, Alan and Alan and um, Flood. And Flood. Yeah, you yes. three. Yeah. And where were the other boys at playing or clubbing? And oh, the, the, for example, uh, Martin Gore was uh, working in another studio doing samples. Oh, okay. He will get samples of record. Obviously, uh, Dave was invol involved in the singing all the time. And uh, Fletcher was involved a lot in the, in the, um, it was a lot in the control room to especially give direction f for what kind of s overall picture to, to achieve. Mm -mm. Yeah, I think um, I, I just and you can you can uh, help me out, yeah, because I know a lot of people sometimes criticize Fletch quite badly for not actually doing much. But with from like also working with Gareth Jones, Gareth has also said, you know, Fletch is not much of a, a natural musician, but he did yeah. have a lot of say and input and passion with regard to the you know the concept and the sound and everything. I confirm. I confirm this hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and uh, if if uh, the sound of the record depends also of the choices made mm. of for the direction, is is very important as well. I mean, it, not there are uh, there are great producers with who don't touch a knob or a key, and they are great anyway because of what they say. And so mm. I agree. Yes, it was very important. That's great. And obviously the the next record, which was the um, Songs of Faith and Devotion record, yeah. um, a lot of things had gone down and it, it was a very stressful and difficult record to make. And the band were at a very bad point in their relationship. What was the vibe like in the studio at this point? I, I think it was very, uh, it was very, there was a lot of uh, co concentration. You know what I mean? The, I think Focus. the, the the main motor was that uh, they knew that this, this record was very important because they were coming from a big American tour. They did a one one live uh, record. And, uh, and so they had to, to do something to, to get the thing going on even, even further. And, and, this, and so, I don't think there was time for personal uh, agendas. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, and and also there was this uh, great distinction between work and fun. Yes. Like in the studio there was work, and then after the studio we were going out in all the clubs in Milano. Oh, and, wonderful. Uh, and so th they knew that the fun will come after finishing the studio, and uh, really. Personally, I didn't feel any personal tension between them. And uh, because I was uh, in the control room doing the, following the, the, the recording aspect. So I don't know then if they were meeting in another room, what they were saying to each other. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. for what I can say in the studio, there was a, like the, the usual studio discussions, yes. like, which is uh, normal. Pina, I want to ask you about Mark Ellis Flood. Um, he's obviously a very talented guy, very knows what he's doing. Um, but was he very strict? Um, was he obviously he can joke and be funny, but what was yeah. he fundamentally? Was he a, a little bit on the um serious side or on the lighthearted side? No, there was no, was not like serious, disturbing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or uh, I'm I'm the boss. Absolutely yeah. not. There was a lot of uh, collaboration. But they they called him also to have uh, to use him. You know what I mean. Mm, yeah. So he, he was very uh, propositive, probably because uh, he also knew. This is my opinion, but probably because he also knew that if if he didn't do enough, mm. was uh, was not good with himself. You know what I mean. Yeah. They call you to do a. A very important record and you have to be sure to do the best even to say in things even if they are not uh, nice when it's needed or not so it was very into it but it, i mean is is here uh flood here it's uh it's amazing he came in the studio and uh, and uh, discover a little difference in a speaker like 
really minor. Wow. And for example, when uh, when they he was choosing this uh, Shure microphone, the SM57, that was was used to do the vocals. I mean, the songs in the in, in that record in the studio in Milano were recorded with the Shure SM57, a really? hundred dollar microphone. Yes. What the, vo- the, the, the vocals to Violator were done on a Shure SM57. Yes, and no. uh, and most of them in the control room with with the speaker very loud. Really? Yes. Yes. Y- y- oh, you see, my mind is blown because you see, um, we all look at Violator as as sonic perfection, and Gareth Jones was also saying this. Um, when they did the um, Ultra album, he was helping with the production of that. Yeah. And Martin Gore did that song called Home. You remember it? Yeah. And he said Martin sang the, 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 the take that is on the record. Martin had a handheld mic in the control room with the speaker playing really loud. And then yeah. I said to Gareth, Gareth, that means there was spill going into the microphone. And yeah. he went, yes, Vaughn, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, yeah. wow. Okay, so can I just say, because you get the SM58, yeah, and then 57, you get the M- 57. Yeah, well, well, usually the SM58 is like the industry standard vocal mic for vocals. But, yes. Yeah, but the 57 is 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 more for instruments. I mean, what what I think was uh, mainly the difference is that the 58 capsule, it, it's made because of uh, for not to get you know too close to the capsule, so it's like a protection, and there is also some foam inside for a. Uh, <laughs> for the breath and uh yeah like a wind, a wind f- pop shield yeah wind wind exactly but with the 57 if you put a a, a wind screen on top of it it's it's uh it's the same but what I, what I was saying is that flood before choosing the 57 ask me how many 57 you have in the studio and i say five or six and he say bring it all year and he he, he uh Choose one by one which one was sounding better. Because there are slight differences between which yes. only he can hear, which only he can yeah. hear. Wow. So we we are we are talking a, a cheap microphone, but he, he will choose the best cheap microphone to record this. Pina, and can uh, I can I just say my mind, sorry guys, I'm a geek. My mind is absolutely blown because you know I know a little bit about microphones. I know we get the SM58, which is like the industry standard, which is, that's an eight. But the SM57 I've known is typically an instrument mic, you know, for miking up drums and stuff. So I just want to say this again. Violator was recorded on, the vocals were recorded on an SM57. Yeah. In the control room. Yes, with uh, loudspeakers. So that (laughs) means if you listen to the vocal takes, there's going to be a lot of, uh, spilled in the background yeah but also because uh, dave has uh, this uh, loud voice yeah with, with the gate when uh, when it's when he's singing loud on the microphone it's like the microphone is compressing yeah everything else so mm. when he's actually singing you don't hear much spill because uh, uh, the gate is not it. singing yeah. It's like, then with the gate, you, you fix these things. So when he's not singing, the gate closes. And when he's singing, he's loud enough to cover the, the, the outside the spill. So it was not really a problem. Wow. My mind is absolutely blown because I would have thought they would have probably used something like a Neumann UA87 or, a, you know. <laughs> we tried it. I mean, we tried this approach with the Neumann in the in the recording room with the monitor the headphone and everything but the performance was not half as good uh, because yeah. david you know is a performer and yeah. uh when when he was in the control room with this microphone i mean in in, uh, in my experience it happened to a lot of singers this that when uh, they sing without thinking they sing better than uh, yeah so when they were in the control room singing, did they have headphones on or no, no, no. Just, just through the no, speakers? speakers. Yes, wow. yes. Wow. 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 Okay. So you said that Dave Garn, he, he sings very loud. Is he? Yeah. Yeah. Very loud. What about Martin? Is he singing quite softly when he records? Yeah. Martin, Martin was using a brilliant Creel microphone. Now he's called DPA. You know, the DPA. Wh- which one was that? Sorry, Pina. 
DPA brand, the DPA of today, okay. at the time was called Bruel and Creel. Was they were doing a microphone yes. for uh, measurement for acoustic measurement, and uh, and Martin brought this microphone and uh, and he was doing all these vocals with this microphone in the in the proper room with headphones like a. Oh, I see. So Martin was in the vocal booth, but Dave was in the control room with yeah. an outspeak. Wow. Yeah, because yeah, I get this idea that Martin, he sings very softly. Yeah, probably, yes. I mean, from the control room, you can't tell because you yeah, hear yeah. the, the of course. amplified sound, so you don't know. But Yeah, but with Dave, it's really ah, very, very strong. The, yeah. And uh, I mean, he was doing a lot of guitars to Martin. All the guitars yeah. uh, of Personal Jesus was done acoustically. He had a Gretsch. Yes, yes, he loves his Gretsch. Um, Pino, yeah. can I just say, this is an absolutely mind-blowing uh, interview, really. I can tell you my oh, guys okay. are going to love this. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to have to get you on again, my friend, <laughs> if it's okay with you. Because <laughs> I also want to talk okay. a bit about you and your career and everything that you're up okay. to. Okay, okay. You know, it's, uh, I see there's a lovely studio you've got there. I might want to interview you on my gig talk series where we talk about your studio and what you've done okay but yeah. um so please jumping back into this though um the demos of uh violator um i haven't heard many of the demos so can you tell us what i've heard the demo of enjoy the silence which is just like a harmonium like pad mm. sound but what were the demos like were they very simplistic S some yes some are very like very produced all right. But and uh, but what what um, the reason why Martin I think was not too much involved in the studio. I mean he was involved, but not when when they were programming sounds. He was not involved much in the studio. Was that he he, he was uh, confident that the song was already there. You know. Yeah, he done mean? his he had done his part. Yeah. He's, yes, he's done his part, and so he was a. Uh, and, uh, and 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 so the demo was like the reference, and sometimes the demo will be the reference to to turn it in. A, we say when you are at school in Bella Copia that you write a draft and then you write it for real. Yes, 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 yes. Going yes, to yes, the yes, teacher, yes. no, was the, was the same thing. Like everything was already there, was just to make it better and uh, more polished. And uh, but some other songs were were completely created in the studio i see respecting uh, every mail because hey, this is important uh, every all the demos he had on the this uh, bbc computer this bbc is a computer from the 80s that um the the good thing about everybody was using uh, atari or uh, or um commodore uh, early macintosh but this BBC computer had a really old school uh, screen, like with no almost no graphics, only numbers. But the, his uh, strength was that he had uh, it had uh, four MIDI outputs in the computer, so the MIDI was really tight compared to getting a MIDI interface for a Macintosh, for example. So uh, all the parts of his demos were in, already in the computer so the, the the notes were already there so just press play on that track and it will play the same note as the demo so in that case the idea was just to replace the sound for example so even if he was not in the studio but his uh, parts were playable uh, through the computer. So that's interesting. So you took the MIDI data and you triggered other synthesizers. So yes, it was still the exactly, parts that exactly. he played, but it was done. Oh, yes. yeah. So that's very interesting. Man, I tell you what, Pino, this is uh, amazing information that uh, we haven't oh, even okay. heard from Flood. <laughs> it really is. Oh, this is really amazing. Um, okay. So I know during the making of Violator, Flood said that I think, I think the you spoke about the songs, but I think the yeah. first song, correct me if I'm wrong, that they were that they kind of got finished was or, or started on was World in My Eyes. And then yes. they went out clubbing. And then I think Fletch and 
and Dave called Flood aside and they said, we're not really feeling this. And then he went, okay. And then they, th then of course they redefined the concept and then yeah. they got the, so what do you remember what that initial version of world in my eyes sounded like or the direction it was going? No. Yeah. No, it's a long mean, time I, ago. <laughs> if it was 30 years ago and in 30 years I heard so many music, so okay. much music. No, uh, actually, uh, now that you say, I remember this, that we redid, we redid some, uh, something in word in my eyes, but probably I don't think was, uh, I don't remember if it was the next day or after working on some other song, they decided yeah. also to redo or the mass. I don't remember well this. Now, well, I must say your memory is very, very good so far. So this is great. So it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, so, you know, talking about the demos and how we get to the finished product, um, Enjoy the Silence is a track that is, it's been well documented. We know how it started. Uh, and then I think Alan and you, were you there with Alan? No, and, no, because they did in Denmark. Oh, was that, oh, that was, yeah, you didn't do Enjoy, yeah. Enjoy the Silence. Okay. So, um, yeah, because I, I know that obviously Martin will come up with his song. He's got the demo and then Alan mm -hmm. will reinterpret it. So was there yeah. any sort of, I don't want to say conflict, but were there any moments where Martin would go, no, 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 I don't like that. Or did he just leave it to Alan and Flood and you? Yeah, there were, but this is normal in every record yeah. I've been involved with. I mean, it's uh, like changing uh I think if something is good, it's good. And uh, if you are not, uh, can you say masochist? Narcissist, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like yeah, yeah. Uh, that you, 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 you are happy if something is bad. If you are not, if you are not like that, oh, I see. Uh, when you hear something good, you, you keep it. And when something it's, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it was a day record and they had to promote it and play it live and be comfortable with it. So for sure, Martin that wrote the songs, if he was not happy with something, he would say it and they would uh, listen to him and do something else. I mean, this is normal in every process of making a record. Yeah. So I don't find it uh, strange. I mean, it's, it's, it would be strange the opposite. If yes, uh, everything yeah. they did, they say, yeah, oh, nice, because yeah. that means yeah. you, you, are, you're not passionate. Not, yes. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did you, you obviously met Francois Kvorkan as well? Yeah. I mean, the, the funny thing was that for the mix of personal Jesus, the, the band left the studio. So, uh, because they don't want it to, to disturb Francois. Uh, and so they, they book another studio for five days. And uh, I think it's where they went to record Dangerous. Uh, is Dangerous the B-side of uh, Personal Jesus? It is indeed. And it's actually, yes. I think, the best B-side on that collection. I, yeah. think, I think it could have gone onto the album, I think, personally. So strong. Yeah. And, uh, and so the, they left the studio went to this other book, this other studio in Milano. And so for five days left uh, uh, Francois Kevorkian. Uh, he brought this, this engineer from New York called Dennis Mitchell and me that I recorded the song. So the three of us were, uh, were there doing the mix. I mean, Francois did the mix. Uh, Francois was chosen because of his work with Kraftwerk, I think. Yeah. And uh, just being there, watching him for me was the best school ever in my life. You know, he, he, on the mixing desk, he, he, he played the mixing desk like an instrument, really. Mm. And uh, the creation, being so creative with effects and stuff. And, and then if uh, he decided, for example, that one part need to be added, uh, it will call them, maybe Alan will come in the studio for a couple of hours and uh, do this overdub. Uh, I remember it was a mini Moog overdub at, at a certain point. And then leave again, and because it uh, was done the mix of the single and the, and the extended version. Yeah. And, um, and for the extended version, 
first of all, he wanted to to include these uh, fake preachers speaching. Yeah. That are in the extended. I don't know even if they are the record. Uh, maybe they are all in the extended version. Yeah, it's got. And is there it, are that, some. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Yeah, There's exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. So, this is 1989. Mm. Today, you go on the internet and look for it, right? Yeah. Download it and use it. At yeah. the time, he had to call this friend in LA to send him a cassette with all this sample. So there was a time where after three days, we were waiting for the courier to deliver the cassette. <laughs> the desk was stuck. Nobody could touch the desk because the mix was set. So it was, was so fun. Then the cassette arrives and uh, he sampled. We sampled all the, the phrases and then he used it. And then to, to do the, the extended version, uh, this is very funny. To do the extended version, I, I did the longest session in the studio in my life. I stayed for 40 hours. 40. Wow. wow. Because uh, I remember, in the, let's say, the, after the next morning, Francois Kevorkian had to leave. He, he, has, he had already mixed the single, and this was the extended version. Okay. So he had to leave the next morning. He had the flight booked and everything. He had to go to, to Japan through LA, very tight schedule. Yeah. And so we work day or night. And I was to myself, I was saying of one thing I'm sure that tomorrow morning he's going to leave. And finally, I can rest because I was dead. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then we are at nine in the morning with the taxi waiting outside. He listened to the tape because at the time the extended version was done mixing by in pieces yeah. and then assembled it to, to tape. So he listened to the tape. Taxis outside. Okay, we are finished. And he says, no, this is too short. We need another 30 seconds here. Yeah. Oh. And I say, what? He say, yes, please cancel my taxi, cancel everything. I get another flight. And wow. but we need 30 seconds more in this version. <laughs> I say, okay. I mean, if and, and to myself, I was so in, because at the time Dennis Mitchell left already, the other engineer. So it was only me and him. And I say to myself, I mean, if this person with the, all this schedule and uh, everything already organized, he was ready to throw everything away to move everything, change everything just for 30 seconds of the extended version that was already six minutes. Wow. And uh, so he canceled everything and he spent the next five hours, six hours to, to do the extended, the 30 second missing, doing dubbing with the desk effects and stuff. And so then he leaves in the afternoon. He say, okay, okay, I go. I, I go and uh, you play the band when they come in, right? And um, the band, of course, they had heard the single already. So the single was already like a... And so the, um, the, it goes, I stay there. Obviously, I, I had to repatch all the keyboards that they brought in the other studio. So it took me forever. And then I play them the extended version. They listen to it, obviously amazed by the result, but I don't, I don't remember who said, maybe it's 30 seconds too long. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And so I say, no, listen. I, and I told the story because they didn't knew that he was staying all night, cancel all the flights. And they said, listen, this is what happened. And they say, okay, let's leave it like this. <laughs> and they left it because he, he spent so much, uh, so much energy. To doing this and then when the 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 single was finished uh daniel miller came in uh, in the studio he came he came many times during the sessions but then he came took the master brought it to london have it mastered in uh, i think five studios to do the vinyl the cutting and then came back two days later with these five uh 
uh, records print masters we put a turntable in the control room and listened all five of the 12 inches and they pick the best wow. and say okay this is the master so, so that's the level of detail and professionalism that is amazing in. so they have yeah. it mastered by five different mastering engineers in and london then they, yes. and they compare them yes and isn't yeah. it, it, it it's it's probably quite difficult pino like you know when you've been working on something for that long to be objective yes so yeah uh, but the i mean the, in a way the uh the personal jesus mix was very creative hmm. and so when when they heard it was like something new not something because at the time the mixing process was very uh important for a record it, it is today but now we are in a way that producer can give to the engineer to mix a almost finished product like sound wise at the time because you were recording uh, analog and every song was sounding different you do, you didn't have the final mix until you do you did it yeah you know what i mean so the um, so when the personal jesus mix was finished was like a surprise because they heard the song as a finished thing as a something to be released for the first time and obviously they were uh, uh, i i think that was already also like a test for Francois Kevorkian because they had to mix the rest of the record mm. and of course they did it with him because it, it was great yes and uh, so that that's the story of, of the remix of personal Jesus the extended version wow. and all the the photos were done in Milan of the cover mm. were uh, done in, I mean the um, Milan at the time it still is today but at the time was a rocking place was a lot of clubbing uh was really yeah 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 a, a lot of soul a lot of vibe yeah yeah yes, yes. um wow this, this this is this is really really mind-blowing so francois kevorkian um i heard that he's quite intense to work with he's very very intense because yeah. he's very passionate is that true yeah yes yes absolutely and then he was telling stories about craft work about uh many stories i mean he, he in in a in a certain kind of music because he was coming from dance music new york dance music but not disco later on yeah and uh and the electronic he, he he really knew how how to do it i mean then he became a dj now he's a famous dj but yes. at the time he was not even a dj he was just doing great mixing on uh for records it was i mean it was it was a very creative engineer mm. you know what i mean using effects in a way that you know coming in italy i never seen no italian engineers doing these sort of things it's like uh, you you play it's like uh, you work in a you do cooking at home and then you go in the best restaurant in the oh, yeah. world to see the the chef preparing something and was that that a step and yeah. for me I, I and then flood came to to mix dangerous at logic mm. because when they when when then francois kevorkian left personal jesus was finished so they had to mix uh, dangerous to do the beside and uh, so i assisted him and i watched him working on the desk and they, again this is like top top level engineers ever wow like uh pino what is the story on i know enjoy the silence you might not know the answer to this but um on violator everything is mixed by francois except for enjoy the silence why is that oh i didn't know this yeah, you see, um, a, a lot of people didn't know that. And um, I'm always trying to hear the, the story because the whole record is mixed by Francois Kevorkian, but the enjoyed the silence version on Violator, I believe is done by Daniel Miller. So I don't know what the reason for this. Some people say that apparently, um, because there is a version of Francois out there and some yeah. people prefer that to the album version, but uh, I don't know what the reason for that is. It's, it's interesting. 
No, probably, probably could be that the record was finished and Francois already left. Probably. And uh, probably Daniel Miller thought that it, it could be different or maybe better or maybe yeah. different. And so they went in the studio and, and did it. So um, this is the, what I, I think yeah. could, have, could have happened. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, you know, because at the end of the day, it, it comes down to, you know, obviously, Francois Kavokin, one of the best. Daniel Miller is very yeah. good as well. Um, Flood's yeah. one of the best. So, but then sometimes there's just a taste. Sometimes you might go, yeah, m maybe the vibe wasn't right or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah but I think if, if was done, was done at the end. Like after yeah. finish every, finishing everything, listening to it, and maybe deciding that the song can be done in a different way. And because they could do it, they did it instead of having him flying back. And also at the time, there was no total recall. So yeah. when a mix was finished, was finished, and there was uh, no way to, to modify it again. Mm -hmm. Now with Pro Tools or whatever we use, you, you make a call, oh, it, turn the guitar up or take away that reverb yeah. and we can record the mix exactly the same and and do these changes and reprint it at the time this was not possible when a mix was finished printed then was it yes yes and also um in the case of francois saying Can cancel my flight cancel my taxi yeah um these days that wouldn't be necessary you could have added 30 seconds quite easily yeah, exactly, exactly. But then again, you wouldn't have such an interesting story to tell, would no, you? No, this is this is really was something. You know, it's uh, I don't remember things of last week. If yeah. you ask me which song did you mix last week, I say probably I don't remember. Mm. I actually I remember, but a month ago maybe I don't remember. And this is thirty years ago, and still I remember everything because you know I was young, I was new to this. Uh, and uh, I had this opportunity that I don't even now believe could have happened. And, uh, and so I really tried to do my best to, to not be fired in a way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, mate, your, your name is on the credits and what a, what an honor, what a fantastic yeah. achievement. Wow. Wow. Absolutely. Well, listen, yes. Peter, I'm going to say, cause th this is one hour and it's gone so fast. Wow. So I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind to come on for another chat, because what I would like to do is I would like to, cause this video is going to come out on the Sunday on my channel okay. and I can promise you it's going to get, a, it's going to get a lot of traffic. And I would like to ask the, the community to send me questions that we can ask you. Okay. Um, and if that's okay with you, I'd like to come on again and do another part. But also Maybe. in that part, I would like to talk about you, your studio, what you're doing okay. and how people can contact you. Is that something you'd be okay. happy to do? Fine. Absolutely. Yes. Great. We can do both next time. And also, I must just say, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. You are so easy to interview and to talk to. You really are. I hope my English was good enough, but. Your English is fine. And can I just say your that that's your studio you're in at the moment? Yes. The, yeah. um, Go on. It, it I, looks amazing. I, in January, in January, I just uh, changed this studio. I was, I'm here since 13 years. And in January, I, I changed the room to do Dolby Atmos mixing. So oh. I, I have a, that's why you see speakers in the back. I see. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and so the I'm uh, I want to start doing actually I did already a few a couple of projects and I want to just to keep me always uh, updated and uh, find new things to be interested because you know it's 30 years I work in the studio actually 34 and uh, and every few years I need to find a new way of working and uh, yes of course because otherwise it can get uh can get not exciting anymore you know what i mean doing the same thing all the, every day for 35 years i'm sure uh pino you, you got a website uh is the name of my studio with just few pictures you can see uh, the, okay. i think in my email that if uh, my signature has got the link to the studio okay what i don't I'm gonna... know if you have seen this if you watch it is uh there sure. are pictures of the studio. 
So oh, the, there are not even a phone number. <laughs> I see. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's on a it's on a need to know basis. I like that. Yeah. Um, so to you guys watching, I'm going to put links to Pino in the okay. description below, and then Pino to you. Uh, as I say, I want to come back on when it's convenient with you, and I want to get some questions that the community would like to ask you. Okay. But I want to say thank you so much. I'm so grateful for this Pleasure. interview. Thanks you have, to you. you. This has been such a great hour and we've learned so much. I can't wait to speak to you again. Thank you very much. Grazie amico. Grazie. Grazie. Ciao. 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 Ciao.